So as the, um, as the father of, of three, ranging in age from seven years to just shy of one year, my life is a series of interruptions. Um, this morning, for instance, questions that I got asked that interrupted me. Can you make a bottle? Um, Dad, where's the Fruit Loops? Can you open the pantry? Can you pour the Fruit Loops? Uh, can you make a pot of coffee? Um, can you pour me a cup of coffee? <laughs> can we watch a show? Can we watch another show? Do I have to brush my teeth before I watch a show? Do I have to put on my socks? Do I have to get in the car? Dad, I have to go to the bathroom. Dad, I went to the bathroom. <laughs> you get the idea. Series of, of, of interruptions. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one, and your life may look different than mine, but I'm sure what doesn't look different is the level of interruptions that, that you may face, or maybe you think about a season in your life when that was definitely true for you. Uh, the story we're going to read this morning is a story of a holy interruption. It comes to us in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, the same chapter we were in last week. It comes towards the end. Beginning in verse 40, this is after Jesus comes back across the Sea of Galilee after having cast out the demon named Legion in Gerasa. Something happens. He's, he's going to be asked to perform a healing, but then he's going to receive a holy interruption. And I think this story has a lot to teach us as we continue during this Lenten journey. It says, when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they had been waiting for him. A man named Jairus, who was a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet. He pleaded with Jesus to come to his house because his only daughter, a 12-year-old, was dying. As Jesus moved forward, he faced smothering crowds. A woman was there who had been bleeding for 12 years. She had spent her entire livelihood on doctors, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the hem of his clothes. And at once, her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When everyone denied it, Peter said, Master, the, the crowds are surrounding you, pressing in on you. But Jesus said, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. When the woman saw that she couldn't escape notice, she came trembling and fell before Jesus. In front of everyone, she explained why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the synagogue leader's house saying to Jairus, your daughter has died. Don't bother the teacher any longer. When Jesus heard this, he responded, don't be afraid. Just keep trusting and she will be healed. And when he came to the house, he didn't allow anyone to enter with him except for Peter, John, and James and the child's father and mother. They were all crying and mourning for her, but Jesus said, don't cry. She isn't dead. She's only sleeping. They laughed at him because they knew she was dead. Taking her hand, Jesus called out, Child, get up. Her life returned and she got up at once. He directed them to give her something to eat. Her parents were beside themselves with joy, but he ordered them to tell no one what had happened. For the word of God in Scripture, and for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, let us say, Thanks be to God holy interruption. Jesus is approached by this man named Jairus with a very concerning and urgent need. My daughter is dying. Please come to my home. And Jesus says, okay. And he's moving forward and this crowd smothers in and suddenly something happens that's going to disrupt everything. It's going to change the story completely. You know, there's so many ways this story could have been told. I mean, we see in other parts of Luke's gospel even that Jesus is able to pass through crowds with no problem at times. It's like he's you know, turns into a ghost or something, just sort of phases through everybody, unimpeded. He could have done that. He doesn't. He allows the crowd to smother him. And then this woman who, who, who 
you know, sneaks through the crowd because she's terrified of what people will say if they find out it's her. And we'll talk more about her in just a moment. She reaches out and touches just the thread, just the hem of his robe. And immediately, what does he do? He says, stop. He could have kept going. Huh, that was weird. You know, oh, goosebumps. You know, he could have kept going. He doesn't. Stop. Someone touched me. Everyone, no, 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 not me, not me, not me, not me. Peter says, hey, boss, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people here. Yeah, someone touched you, you know, smothering crowd. We covered that, right? And Jesus says, no, 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 so, someone, someone touched me. I felt power leave me. And then when he identifies her, he could have gone, huh, and kept going, but he doesn't. He stops. He locks eyes with her, and he says something really important. We'll talk about it in a moment. But for right now, uh, I want us to focus on the fact that Jesus allows himself to be interrupted in the midst of such an urgent crisis. Such an important thing is going to Jairus' house to heal his daughter. There's, there's not much more I can think of as being more important than that. And yet, this story, this story that's not just in Luke, it's also in Mark, it's also in Matthew, this story communicates something about Jesus' willingness to be interrupted. And so then I think the story is communicating something to you and to me about what it means to be interrupted. I can't help but think about the story of the Good Samaritan as I, as I see this story. This is a, a parable that Jesus tells about what it means to, to live with a fullness of love for your neighbor. And when he's explaining what that looks like, it's interesting because he describes a scene not unlike this one where there's these really high and holy men that are on their way to do something really important. You know, they're going to temple. They're doing, going to do this very holy and righteous work. And, and this is important stuff that important righteous people do. And so they don't have time. They, they don't allow themselves to be interrupted by the man in need. And then this good Samaritan comes along. You know, all he's trying to do is just, you know, live his life. And, and he allows himself to be interrupted to have his whole day thrown off and, and to have his whole week thrown off as he ends up coming back and checking on the man later on. And, you know, I see Jesus here as a high holy man interacting with the synagogue leader. This is the chair of the church council, right? I mean, this is a high holy man that he's interacting with. And, and he's supposed to be going to do really high holy righteous work healing the, 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 the chair of the church council's daughter. And he allows himself to be interrupted. I got to say, as a, as a husband and a father of three, my, my Google Calendar looks like a tire fire most weeks. Does anybody else's Google Calendar look like a tire fire? Is that just me? Yeah. Man, I want y'all's calendars, evidently. There's always something that I'm supposed to be getting to, something that's very important, probably two things that are very important, trying to be in two places at once, running five minutes behind everywhere I go, constantly, constantly, constantly. And, and, and yet I, I stop and I see this story. And I notice that with endless urgent needs and smothering crowds, Jesus still remains open to holy interruption. And then that creates a question that rests upon my heart, which is this. When the Holy Spirit nudges me towards someone in the same way that it nudges the Good Samaritan, in the same way that it nudges Jesus towards this unnamed woman, what's my response going to be? And when I talk about a Holy Spirit nudge, I talk about these, these moments when that name just comes to mind. That person that you haven't heard from in a while that you used to hear from quite a bit. It's, the, it, it's that person that the last time you spoke, you didn't leave things the way that you wish you could have. And you know you need to do something about it, but you're kind of putting that off. It's the person that quite honestly, you can't figure out why their name just popped in your head, but it did. It's, I want us to actually stop for a moment and consider wherever, wherever you are. What, what name might come to mind? Because here's the wild thing, in my experience, when, when I get these nudges, they're never at opportune times, right? I, I can't calendar for a Holy Spirit nudge. Okay, on Tuesday at 1.30 p.m., I'm going to set aside 30 minutes. Holy Spirit, come on, right now. Okay, you got 25 more minutes. Let's go, Holy Spirit. You know, it doesn't work like that. It's when I'm in the car on the way to somewhere. Don't text while you drive. It's when I'm in a meeting about something really important. It's when, you know, I'm doing something that I know I'm supposed to be doing, and then suddenly that name just pops in my head, and I can't let it go, and I go, what do I do with this? And the craziest thing is that every time, and I mean every time, when I follow that nudge and I send that text or I make that phone call, whether it's as small as, wow, thank you for checking on me. Everything's fine, but it's nice to know that I matter. Or if it's something serious like, 
actually I'm experiencing postpartum for the first time and uh, I think I need to go see a doctor and maybe this is the conversation that needed to nudge me in that direction. Like the Holy Spirit nudge does not fail in my experience. And it is so easy to miss because our lives are so programmed and so scheduled and we, and we consider interruptions to be nuisances and yet I wonder how this story would have been different if Jesus had only paid attention to that most urgent, most important thing that was already on his schedule for the day. I think part of walking faithfully in the footsteps of Jesus is opening ourselves up to those holy interruptions, those Holy Spirit nudges. Because the Holy Spirit's always going to lead us towards people, towards relationship, towards reconciliation, towards the things that, that bring goodness and wholeness like we see in this story lived out. And so let's take a closer look at, at the person that interrupts Jesus. Let's talk about this unnamed woman. To understand her story, we have to understand the, the, the cleanliness codes that, that existed in her day. So this is, you know, first century Jewish community. And there were three things that were really, really unrighteous, impure, unholy, unclean. When we say unclean, we don't just mean like, I got a stain on my jeans. Like unclean as in like, you can't go to temple. As in like, you shouldn't touch anybody else because then they can't go to temple. Like, like strong language of like unholy or desecrated, right? Unclean. Three things. They, they were uh, corpses, de dead bodies. Okay, there's probably a lot of good reasons for, for having laws around that. Be careful around, around that. Um, leprosy, contagious, painful skin disease, and menstruation. Thank you, historical patriarchy. Those three things really seem to go together, don't they? <laughs> Literal corpses, leprosy, and a regular bodily function that happens monthly. Yeah, 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 that sounds about right. Let's lump those three things together. Um, can I get... And amen. Thank you, <laughs> historical patriarchy. Okay. So this, I, I'm underscoring this to say this is the kind of company that this woman would keep, right? Twelve years she has been lumped into this category. Twelve years she has been unable to touch or be touched. Twelve years she has been unable to have meaningful relationship. Twelve years she has just felt physical pain. I don't know what it's like to feel these things, but I'm told that the cramps are real. And that the energy drain is real, even in a normal cycle. And this woman is living 12 years with this. She spent her life savings on healers who have not been able to cure her. She has drank potions that God knows what they contain. She's acting as someone who is ashamed of her illness because she's been conditioned to think of herself as shameful. And unlike Jairus, she has no position, she has no status, she has no name. She's not righteous and holy. In fact, she's not even allowed to step within 50 feet of the synagogue. But she sneaks through the crowd and she touches the hem of his robe and she immediately, it says, immediately she knows that she's healed. And this, I think, communicates a couple things. Number one, I think she physically knew her body well enough to know that oh, it stopped. Oh my God. To feel that level of internal angst and pain and then to have it gone in a moment. And then I think it's also communicating something about this theme that we see through this story of trusting that inner truth, trusting that inner knowledge that lives deep within. And she knows she's been healed in the way that she has been desperate for for 12 years. And then she tries to slip away because again, she thinks she's done something bad, honestly. She thinks she's done something that could get her punished. She's scared of what the, the healer might say to her. And if you're a first-time hearer of this gospel living in the first century, you honestly might be concerned for her too because she's kind of stolen the gift of the healer. That's not what you're supposed to do. And so that crowd and that healer would have every right and power and privilege to treat her very harshly, but that's not what happens at all. In fact, Jesus seeks her out not to scold her or to chastise her, but because he knows that healing is one thing. She's already received healing through this touch. But wholeness is another thing. And Jesus is here to offer her both. The wholeness comes in the way that he speaks to her. He locks eyes with her. Thank God to be in her shoes in that moment, to wonder what's about to come out of his mouth. In the first two words, he says, my daughter, this is a woman who, if Jairus is up here in the social ladder, uh, she is what the ladder is standing upon, right? Like 
her status could not get lower. And immediately Jesus says, my daughter. So he's restoring her social status. In fact, uplifting it far beyond those who are gathered around her. And then he says, your faith has healed you. Your faith. The woman who wasn't allowed to go to synagogue, the woman who was deemed perhaps accursed by the religious leaders in her community, the, the woman who everyone should stay away from because she might drag you down with her. Her faith is what healed her. So Jesus is uplifting her agency, her faithfulness, saying, yeah, my power flowed through you, but it's your faith that drew it in. And then he says, go in peace. We, the manuscripts we have are in Greek, so we don't know this, but I imagine the word that he used there was something like shalom. It's this this Hebrew word that doesn't just mean peace in terms of stillness like we talk about peace, of like the absence of conflict, but, but peace that comes from a wholeness, a oneness. Go whole. Go one. Go in peace. He says to this woman whose body has been warring with itself, whose community has ostracized her, who's been taught to be ashamed and to think of herself as lower than the lowest, go in peace. One reason I, I can't look away from the story this week, one reason it's captivated me is because of the way that her faithfulness is teaching me this week. I, I've said this before in sermons, but I'm a recovering cynic. Any other cynics in the room? Yeah, is that, I know I'm not alone on that one. Um, I tend to, I call myself a realist, but I'm really a pessimist at times. And, you know, if something's not going well, it's not going to get better. This is just the way things are, Right? What's going to change, really? And here's a woman who had been living with, with cramps, these incredibly painful internal conflicts and cramps inside of her own body for 12 years. I can't get over that. 12 years. By six months, I would have said, it ain't changing. 12 years, she doesn't give up. 12 years. She continues, 12 years, she hears about a healer coming to town, 12 years, she pushes through the crowd, reaches out her hands and says, I will not be done until I know this can be different. I know this can be different. I know this can change. God, her faith is something to be admired. 12 years. Another question rests upon my heart. Have I lived with a cramp in my life for so long that I've lost faith that I could be healed and made whole? Maybe I need to look to this saint this week to be reminded what that tenacity of faith that I think Jesus is speaking about, that tenacity of faith could do. Is there a cramp in my life that I've just learned to live with, that I've lost faith that I could be healed and made whole? I think part of the promise of the gospel is that things can be different. Maybe not in the way that we wish they could be different. Maybe not in the way that we want them to be different. But things can be different. That there's this, there's this holy, dogged optimism at the heart of the gospel that things can actually get better, darn it. And she gets it. And I wish I got it like she does. So then the story continues. This holy interruption changes everything. Jairus' daughter has now died. And, and, and remember, this is the high holy guy that's supposed to really understand faith, it's supposed to really understand God, it's supposed to really understand how God works with people in, in the world. And all of his friends say, hey, send that guy home. There's nothing he can do now. We know this is no time for a healer. And Jesus says, whoa, whoa, whoa. slow down. Keep trusting, he says. That word trusting, I, I hear him pointing to the unnamed woman's faith and saying, you see what she's got? I need you to have a little bit of that. Twelve years, I need you to have a little bit of that. And, and, and then Jesus comes inside and he says, hey, I promise there's something that can be done. She's just sleeping. Let's wake her up. And they laugh at him because they know, they know, they know this is it. Nothing good could possibly come from this. This is it. And Jesus' response kind of hit our ears as sounding almost uncaring, right? Keep trusting. Don't cry. I mean, this poor man has just lost his daughter. But I don't know that Jesus is calling us to be detached from our natural emotions 
or detached from our grief because that is all too real in this world. I, I don't think that Jesus is asking us to live in a fantasy land where the life that we live and, and the, the good or bad that we experience in this life is directly tied to our faith or lack thereof. We've covered this in recent weeks. But instead, what I see in this story when Jesus commands the girl to wake up after everyone is certain that that's just not going to happen, I see, number one, Jesus' fearlessness in continuing to encounter people, specifically a woman and a girl, whom their society had deemed unclean and unholy, and yet Jesus reveals are unexpected sites of salvation. How often we think we are so certain as to what holiness looks like, what cleanliness looks like, and Jesus surprises us once again and says, let me show you what salvation looks like, and it's not what you expect. But secondly, maybe even more importantly, it's underscoring this idea that, you know, here's Jairus who could recite the doctrines and dogmas of his faith like anybody. He could recite the scriptures. He knows everything you're supposed to know, and everyone around him is so certain they understand who God is and how God works in this world, and yet it's the unnamed woman that shows them what faith maybe really looks like, and, and maybe Luke is showing us that faith in Christ is not simply a new doctrine to be learned or dogma to be digested, but instead it's living with that dogged, desperate commitment to the idea idea that healing and wholeness are in fact possible for us and for others. Pointing back to the unnamed woman to saying, don't you dare think you've got a handle on how God works because here's something that you think is impossible, that you think the natural world just simply works this way and God's going to say, no, I'm working differently than you think. I'm working in a supernatural way outside of your expectations. Since the start of the year, there, there have been a few things in my life I won't go into the details of that uh, I've been rather cynical about, quite frankly. I've kind of assumed I know where they're headed. There's a lot going on in our broader church right now. There's a lot just happening in my own family. And I stumbled across this story that, thank God, we had picked it in worship planning weeks ago because I needed it this week. Because there's times that I'll be honest, I, I don't have the faith that she possesses. And I learn to live with the cramps. And I forget reaching out my hand. I don't even make it to the crowd. I think, bah, that's not for me. Thank God for her. Maybe her faithfulness, maybe her tenacity, maybe her beautiful, vicious love of God that claws through crowds and reaches a trembling hand out in faith. Maybe, maybe her salvation isn't just for her. Maybe it could be for me as well. Maybe it could be for us. Dogged and determined. Healed and whole. May it ever be so. Amen.